Okay, great. Thanks so much for everyone joining us live right now on this session. This is the second installment of part A, um, a series dedicated to exploring what is emergent in this space of transformation during the COVID context and the pandemic year that we are experiencing. A few months ago, um, especially from the UNDP lens, of course, we are very much um, having lots of conversations and striving to find different ways to approach and react to the crisis. At this stage, we certainly know that uh, COVID is not a sprint, it's, it's a marathon, but it also opens up a big space and opportunity to think differently, not necessarily just build back better, but build towards the future. Um, many people, uh, you could see it in certainly in different conversations and articles, et cetera, you know, the, the way things were, the, the normal, so to speak, is not necessarily something that was ever really working from a systems and systemic lens. And therefore, what we would like to do, especially with this series, so um, is really dive into those opportunity spaces. Uh, last week, we kicked off with Climate Kick on systemic investing, different ways of looking at transformational capital. And that was a deep dive into financing models that might be ways to move forward for systemic change that was, is really required at speed and scale. Um, if we want to even get close to connecting with our SDG uh, to-do list globally, and certainly just for the well-being of future generations and beyond. So this week, and certainly connected to many other uh, threads of discussion, is really around infrastructure for enabling this kind of mobilization of, of talent, of resources, of conversations, and not only from a financial perspective. Um, we're going to explore what does it look like from a social capital perspective, from systemic entrepreneurs' lens and, and perspectives such as that. So uh, we're running today as a lightning panel, and what that means is that we'll have three speakers, as you can see here, um, that are going to be sharing different pieces of perspective, particularly drawing upon their work and their observations as practitioners. Um, and then thinking about how does this connect not only from a, to, the, to, the, to the audience of the UNDP, the hosts of the, the series, but to the ecosystem at large. And um, leading up to that in 2020, we've had two key reports uh, coming from a consortium led through Ashoka as well as Catalyst 2030 and others, um, which we'll learn a lot more about. But ultimately uh, with provocations and ways to be thinking through uh, and acting differently towards this, uh, this moment of change. So I'm really excited to have uh, both you know, with us. Our first speaker is gonna share um, Odin Mohabin from, he's a partner with Ashoka and share a little bit more about um, the foundation in, in the lens in which we're approaching this conversation. After Odin, we're going to hear from Jeru, who is a Schwab Fellow, Ashoka Fellow, certainly um, started multiple initiatives, dare say I, uh, fire starter for, for the movement, if you will, in the ecosystem. Um, and then also, well, cap it, uh, or bookend it, I should say, and hearing a little bit more about uh, the role of systemic entrepreneurs from a public sector, public innovation space with some concrete examples uh, shared by Olga. Um, so it is a conversation. Um, it is about building a safe space for us to have these kinds of provocations and discussions of debate and dialogue. So we do hope that you are uh, feeling very comfortable to share any kind of questions or comments, perspectives in the chat box, in the Q&A, um, and we'll build a conversation based off of, uh, of what you wanna be discussing. So first and foremost, big thanks again to our panel. This is a series uh, delivered, so to speak, in collaboration between um, the regional Asia Pacific uh, hub of, of uh, the UNDP, as well as Eurasia too. So first, uh, over to you, Odin, and, and thanks again. Thank you, Courtney. Did I manage to change the, the screen share? Yes, smooth so far, right. yep. <laughs> Perfect. Um, welcome everybody. Um, Courtney asked me to start with a little bit of uh, definition and background, so I hope that this is not yet the, the provocative part. Um, I'm just quoting here from one of the reports that Courtney mentioned, Embracing Complexity. And this is the, uh, the common denominator of many social entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurship networks in the ecosystem. Um, so you, you might find slightly different approaches, but this is what we can all agree to. Uh, systems change to us means addressing root causes rather than symptoms. By altering, shifting and transforming structures, customs, mindsets, power dynamics and rules through collaboration across a diverse set of actors, 
with the intent of achieving lasting improvement of societal issues on a local, national and global level. And um, yeah, for us, I think the, the national and global level is most relevant here, but um, just to acknowledge that systemic changes can also, like they don't have to be big, they can also be in a local setting as long as they, they really change the structures or the, the mindsets of um, actors in, in the system we're talking about. Now, the question is, how do we achieve such changes? Um, and in order to explore that, we looked at one particular barrier that we stumble upon uh, again and again, which is funding. And uh, together with a number of leading networks in the space, uh, namely Ashoka, Catalyst, Co-Impact, Echo in Green, the Schwab Foundation and Skoll Foundation, with help from McKinsey and Systemic to consultancy companies, um, we did a we did an overview report of what people in the sector think should be happening in order to fund systemic initiatives properly. And we came up with five principles um, that apply very directly to philanthropic organizations, but we believe should also apply quite directly uh, to government agencies and UN agencies. Now, I can only read the principles for now. I think they will become more tangible as the uh, and my colleague Olga talk about more specific examples. But just to give an overview, um, we believe five things are important. First, embrace the system's mindset. Um, this is like, have an idea what on a systems level you actually want to change. Um, have some sort of systems analysis, have a mapping of the system, like really apply systems thinking to, to what you do and your strategies around it. And second, support evolving paths to systems change. This means that like move away from five-year project plans that uh, already assume that you know what's happening in three years time because you probably don't um, allow you allow the partners that you work with to change plans as they see fit to learn and adjust their strategies and be okay also with failure because this is uh, this is inevitable when we work and engage with complex social systems. Uh, we, we just can't assume a success rate of 80%. That's not going to happen. Um, third, work in true partnership. This is around um, acknowledging power dynamics, working at eye level, um, making sure that, that we create the social capital that is needed to collaborate in an effective way on the systems level. Um, this, is, this might sound like a soft uh, like a soft factor, but it's actually really important uh, for successful collaborations. We cannot stress this enough. Um, this, in, when we look at the UN and its interplay with social entrepreneurs, means also to, uh, to, to have somebody at the UN who can speak social entrepreneurship language um, and vice versa. Otherwise, it, it becomes really difficult to, to come together. Uh, fourth, prepare for long-term engagement. Again, um, complex systems, so probably we take some time to change them to find these new points of equilibrium um, for lasting change. So don't expect systemic changes to happen in two, three, or even five years in many cases. Um, once you have decided for, for a system, systems perspective and then goal, um, yeah, be prepared to, to support initiatives around that goal for at least 10 years. Everything else is probably futile. Um, and then finally, collaborate with other funders and stakeholders. So don't, don't assume that even as a UN, um, you, can, you can achieve systemic changes um, by yourself or with a small set of um, initiatives that you support. Um, any interesting relevant systems change will require a broad coalition um, involving business, civil society, academics, activists, etc. Um, now, this, um, this is of course quite, quite abstract, but it is a set of principles that is acknowledged by pretty much everybody in the sector. So this includes um, the eight partners that I mentioned before. Um, it is consistent with 70 other sources that we screened for this report. Um, none of the 100, uh, over 100 social entrepreneurs from around the world had any serious disagreement with any of those principles. And we also did interviews with 60 intermediaries, again, from around the world, um, only accepting them, like no, no veto on any of the principles. So. Um, if you take this report, about 100 pages, this is what the social entrepreneurship sector thinks about funding systems change. Um, if you do this, you, you'll, be, you'll be on the safe side. Now, this is the consensus part and the definition part, but Courtney also asked me to, um, to have a provocation. So here's my provocation. Um, think for a moment about the iPhone and 
what made it possible? Uh, yes, um, at, the, at the end of the day, we have this neat little shiny handheld device that can do all sorts of things. But like looking at the foundation for this. So first there's, there's basic research that was necessary to make all the amazing functionality of an iPhone possible. And I mentioned only very few of those here. Um, one is the GPS uh, technology, which was developed by the US Department of Defense. Then you have things like MP3 compression to have all the audio files and uh, yeah, uh, come to your device and fit on your disk, which was developed by the Fraunhofer Society, a research uh, institute, a public one in Germany. Then you have things like lithium ion batteries. Like to, for this thing to actually run for a few hours, you need really amazing battery technology, which in this case was developed in the 1970s by a university in Germany and so on and so forth. Then on top of the basic research, you need quite a bit of infrastructure. And that can mean technical infrastructure like the GPS satellite arrays, which are operated by the United States Space Force. It can also mean um, norms and technical standards, um, which in this case are curated and defined by the International Organization for Standardization, which is um, in, like a, an association of several national bodies of um, standardization, which are public bodies in, uh, in most cases. So what you can see here is that, that governments and um, and, and public-like structures provide the foundation for then uh, like an apple to come along and put all these things into a neat little shiny package and earn a lot of money with it. But, but the last piece, like the putting everything together in a neat little package, that is not, I think, the role of governments and UN agencies. Like once the foundation is in place, like some, some sort of apple will come along and make use of these things. You can be pretty sure about that. Um, and, and this is my, this is my reservation when it comes to social finance and social capital. Yes, we need, we need social finance to use all the, the basic stuff that is in place to come up with innovative, socially responsible, sustainable business models and, and social innovations. But, but you can count on the, uh, on civil society to do that. You like nobody, uh, Steve Jobs didn't need help from the state to collect the capital to make the iPhone happen. Um, he needed the state to do all the underlying stuff. And it's, I think, pretty similar when we look at so, uh, systemic social innovations. Um, yes, you can help more social ventures um, rally social capital, like in, in terms of loans or investment capital and stuff like that. But actually, whenever something makes sense from a business perspective, it's already being carried out without that help, in most cases at least. I think what the UN should focus on more is, uh, is these underlying, um, is, is the, the policies and the standards and, and the norms that are required to make more, so, more social businesses possible. And so this would mean a shift away from, from social capital and social investing and looking more at um, how can we change the incentives so that more social ventures become possible? How can we create a, a working carbon certificate global market that these ventures can use to, to make a profit? How can we standardize um, the, the ways in which we exchange information on forests so that, you know, like all, all the, the underlying stuff. And this is, um, so this is to say, um, don't, don't ignore social capital and the social investing market completely, but look mostly at what these actors need uh, to function by themselves. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jeru and Olga who can make these things more concrete. Thanks, thanks, Odin. So um, you had some interesting uh, takeaways and of course provocations as I was, I was hoping you would. And uh, to our audience joining, of course, you know, not everyone is with the, the UN and, and can speak in, as a profile of the UN, but um, what we do hope is that either you, this inspires some new uh, ways of thinking or possibly it creates a visceral reaction where if so, we can dig into why is that the case and, and build into a stronger conversation uh, in moments from now. So over to Jeru, and I believe uh, Susanna has got the slides. So to share the screen, Susanna. And Jeru, you're on mute. So if you want to unmute. Oh, sorry, I was talking away happily with there my name. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, love it, hate it. 
Okay, so basically, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I represent an organization called uh, Catalyst 2030. It's rather a movement. Uh, Ashoka, which Odin is, is the founder member. We have uh, close to 250 members currently in the movement, reaching over a billion people across 179 countries. So our partners are working and it's very diverse. And uh, basically what uh, Catalyst does is two main things. It fosters systems changing collaborations across entrepreneurs, but also with say the UN with uh, with anybody so this is my open invitation to everyone is foster system changing collaborations amongst the members so we are looking at a new way of taking all training across the world and seeing how it can be catalyzed I mean it can be uh, collected so we can look at it we are looking at a new system of client driven evaluation using technology so some of these things which we are talking and on the second part, what we do is actually what Odin talked about, which is how do we change the ecosystem so the iPhone can actually function? How do we change the ecosystem so innovation can happen across all levels? So these are the two main pillars on which uh, Catalyst functions. And with this, what we did is when COVID hit and uh, we started talking, Social entrepreneurs were the first people at the forefront. Social entrepreneurs were the first to respond to crisis, to move into what has to happen. And yet the voices of the social entrepreneurs were not being heard. So along with our main partners and their other partners, we had 1,600 organizations partner to create a report, uh, which was there, which was launched by Amina Muhammad, which is getting from crisis to systems change. So Courtney, you were saying in your earlier session, what is it that we do? How do we build back better for the future? How do we change the future? Well, this report contains the advice for leaders across all sectors based on what we have heard as social entrepreneurs in the field. And remember, our network reaches a billion people. So this has really substantive uh, recommendations. I'm not going to go into all the recommendations because they are by sector and they are by uh, they are by sector and they are overall recommendations. But what I am going to look at is some of the concrete things which can happen and uh, which actually many of you have the power to make happen. So if I can move into the next slide, thank you. Some of the key game changing is. We really think leaders need to commit to systems change and they need to building back better. That is not happening, but we are looking at how to make that happen. One of the key suggestions which we gave Amina Muhammad, which came through is that why don't we have a special rapporteur in the UN who is there to make sure that the ecosystem changes the way we want. We can call it a systems change rapporteur or special advisor or whatever but by doing that this person is coordinating across the 84 un bodies across everything and then all the diverse project-based work or portfolio-based work as UNDP is talking about all comes together and we can have the tech support to back it and then we are actually building off rather than working in silos so this is something which we thought was quite important it's not that much to do and actually uh, Miss Amina Mohammed said she was going to discuss it and see if it was possible. So any one of you please think about it and put this forward again. This is to many of you I saw there were quite a few UNDP country offices which are there. When you're taking a decision on an issue can you please also invite social entrepreneurs in the country to join you in making that decision. So to build on that expertise, because I think that is something which is really, really important. And while doing that more systemically, if all governments can actually have a contact point at a relatively high level, so that we are able to pool in resources. Because currently there is a big disconnect between what's happening in the field, what's happening with the UN, what's happening with country offices. But if you took some of the wonderful innovations and Olga is going to be talking about them and built them, I think then it would be able to do it. 
And of course, we also have lots of ideas on how we can finance this. And Odin has talked on that, so I won't go into it. Some of the other things, if we can go to the next slide, please. Huh? With y'all, again, every UN office and with the UNDP, you all have the UNDP hubs, which you all are creating. I think it would be really nice if we could collaborate with all our Catalyst members, so with Catalyst, to link social entrepreneurs into the hub. And if there are any resident coordinators, I think it would be a nice time to be able to also tell them, hey guys, let's start working. Let's create pilots where things work. So Courtney, my suggestion is at the end of this session, uh, if we move to the next slide also, my, at the end of this session, what would be really, really lovely is if we can have a one-stop shop in some countries, we are able to work with you guys to have at least 10 pilot countries where we are able to take off something in, in the next year. Having a one-stop shop, working with the hubs, working with the countries, and having entrepreneurial solutions in. Because I always say we have a lot of webinars, but we have very little action. So hopefully at the end of this session, I would like to see some action. And let's try to make it happen. Thank you very much. And over to, I think, Olga, who's actually going to talk about how it has already happened. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeru. And... Um... Duly noted. So we'll get into some of the discussion around, you know, the infrastructure and, and the pipeline. So as um, our panelists are aware, we have a few different <laughs> initiatives through the UNDP around NextGenGov and certainly the Accelerator Lab Network, which is really designed um, at scale to be able to have a closer connection to what's happening on the ground, of course, solutions and, and things that uh, social entrepreneurs or systemic entrepreneurs, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, um, are already creating some of these hyper-local context relevant types of responses to the, to the challenges that sometimes can be replicated elsewhere or else inform uh, a process, for example. So I know that Olga's got uh, experience literally working in the public sector and then transitioned into uh, work at uh, Ashoka, which was then transformed into how do we build these connections and bridges um, between those working on the field as practitioners and then those making uh, influencing decisions upstream. So Olga, um, if you're able to share your screen, then we can, we can grab onto some of those. Yes, thank you. Before I share my screen, a brief um, intro here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Odin and Jeru have shared a bit more uh, about social entrepreneurship um, and the role social entrepreneurs can play in working with government. And I wanted to clarify here the difference um, in the understanding of social entrepreneurs that exist in the world, maybe just to highlight it a bit more. Ashoka has come up with, uh, with the term social entrepreneur about 40 years ago. And by social entrepreneur, we mean uh, someone who undertakes systemic measures to address uh, social problems in different fields. So very often social entrepreneurship now is understood as social business, somebody um, having a company and achieving uh, in parallel to um, earning profit, achieving some social mission, where, while the social mission is not necessarily first. Well, the social entrepreneurs in the understanding of Ashoka are people who have the deep empathy for, for the problem and uh, put all their efforts into making sure that systems are improved. And then they are very resourceful in how they bring in different resources from different um, sides. So they could be earning their own revenue, but they could also be combining uh, funding from different sides. So just to make sure that we are clear on the, the definition of, of a social entrepreneur or a systemic entrepreneur who we'll be talking about. And now maybe a bit more on the definition of a system, what we mean by a system. Uh, Odin has already shared um, a definition of a systems change. Now let me briefly recap what we understand by a system. We understand by a system, and many of you I'm sure understand the same way, that the system is a set of interconnected elements that serve a shared purpose. And one can say that system consists of five types of elements, resources that come into the system and then results that come out. There are some roles and relationships that help transform the resources into results. And there are some rules that govern the system. If we think about um, government and the role government plays in so many systems around us, be it education, healthcare, environment protection or others, we could say that government, first of all, um, has control over the rules, the regulations and norms and standards that uh, govern the system. 
But then governments, of course, are also in control of budgets, uh, large infrastructure, human resources um, that we can see in public education or public health care. And then government itself can often uh, play a role of delivering a specific service um, to a, at a certain scale. And it can also be playing a role of quality control over others over other players. Of course, it's not only limited to uh, the roles of government are not only limited to what I just said, but these are the basic roles that we see government could play in the system. So what does it mean for a social entrepreneur or a systems entrepreneur? Um, many uh, systems entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs are citizens who see the problem and they cannot stay um, not engaged in, in solving this problem. And very often they become these little dots in the system who start delivering a particular service, but very often uh, soon they face some limits um, in that delivery and they need to make sure that they address the problem at a relevant scale. So for them, it means either growing the, their organization, which has some limits because they cannot be, even if they double their efforts or uh, increase it 10 times, often they cannot address the scale of the problem. Or that means creating the space for others to also deliver a specific service or influencing the government, the role it plays or the resources it controls or changing the rules so that the system um, suggests or offers uh, the, the conditions that would enable more players to uh, participate in solving the problem. So this is the role that uh, systems entrepreneurs play and very often what they bring into the system uh, while governments have l large resources, they often, we see, have some a risk aversion or their decisions that are being made are made in a slow way. What social or systems entrepreneurs can bring is de-risking some undertaking um, and working together with government in building, developing the innovation and giving it over to government um, if government is willing to take it up. So once a social entrepreneur, a systems entrepreneur is clear who their government counterpart is, we see that there are three dimensions that they could be um, working on influencing in their, on the side of their government counterpart. First is awareness on the problem. Do government counterparts actually understand or are they aware about the specific problem that um, a, a social entrepreneur is talking about? Or are they aware of the role that government itself might be playing in keeping the problem in place? And here, the tactics or the, the work that uh, social entrepreneurs could be doing is um, shedding the light on data that already exists. It might be scattered, it might be fragmented, or developing own data um, and making sure that it's packaged in a way that is understandable and, and delivered to the right ears. Here, we can say that uh, the very fact of generating data on a missing um, topic or missing data could be a, a very significant systemic contribution on its own. And we see a very important role of intermediaries in helping to shed light on the problems and also um, streamline, uh, streamline the, the data and evidence um, in one place. The second dimension is once our government counterparts have the information or awareness or knowledge on the problem, it's not enough to, um, to move them to action. So what's the next step could be is making sure that the, the issue is relevant to government counterparts and that also there is um, an opinion formed on that issue that moves them to action and also increases their receptiveness to a proposed approach and willingness to, to act despite the risk. What we see here social entrepreneurs doing is that they exercise um, the tool called empathy map. They, they have to understand what the government counterparts need to hear, feel, um, see about the proposed approach to, to move a step forward. And then they also need to make sure that government counterparts understand the risks and the benefits they, they, they will have with taking up that specific approach. And then the third dimension that government counterparts, um, some, that social entrepreneurs need to influence is capacity to implement, which could be both on the human side, uh, human resources side and the financial side. Sometimes of uh, our conversations with social entrepreneurs around the world, we see that they mention government could just literally lack hands to implement a specific approach that uh, they propose, or they may lack um, the specific know-how or qualification among the civil servants. Or if we talk about the financial side, there might be not enough funding or uh, the, the funding is not used in the most efficient way. And then the role of a social entrepreneur could be to, to help their government counterparts um, see the ways in both attracting uh, additional funding, making sure the funding is used well in the proposed approach or building up the capacity of uh, government counterparts if the problem is in the human resources. 
So there are a couple of examples. We have written down eight case studies recently on social entrepreneurs around the world. And this is an example of Clara from the Czech Republic who works on making sure that education is inclusive for all children disregarding their um, uh, health status or uh, ethnic uh, or social background. So what she has been doing, she has been uh, very actively collecting and effectively communicating evidence on the problem of segregation in the Czech school system um, in combination with some other partners outside of the Czech Republic and in cooperation with academics. She's been drawing attention to good practice at home because there are multiple flagship schools and players who are providing inclusive education and she's been actively taking their government counterparts abroad to see that this is actually possible for them to see the new reality. She's also been cultivating the culture of trustful relationships among diverse stakeholders in the system and she has been the orchestrator of collective effort so that the advocacy that uh, is happening is comes from different directions and is like stereo advocacy. She has been also very active in building up the capacity to implement on the side of government. She has been this um, very constructive partner on the side of government in terms of um, ensuring there is a clear roadmap of a reform towards inclusive education. And she has been herself drafting a legislation bill and insisting on special budget allocations, which have been made. In 2016, Czech Republic has adopted a new um, education law and uh, significant resources have been unlocked. Now about yearly, about 200 million euros are unlocked to ensure that every school in the Czech Republic has a specific teacher force um, aimed at uh, helping and supporting children with special education needs to make sure that they feel comfortable in the education process, but also that the education process is smooth for all other children without the special education needs. Since her intervention, there are several dozens, thousands of children who are now with special education needs who are now involved uh, in the shared education process. And what she's been doing, with what Clara has been very actively doing, she's been supporting the reform management at the national level and on the, at the regional level. She's been part of this reform committee and very importantly, she has been um, with her partners developing methodological materials for teachers, teachers assistants and uh, school principals and providing trainings for them to ensure that this new, uh, these new changes that happened, they are internalized. And after some um, evaluation they carried out, they have seen that most of the school principals who uh, were concerned about this reform before are now, um, now have both the human and financial resources to carry it out. She also has been very instrumental in leveraging the EU funding to support the reform implementation by writing a specific EU uh, proposal, um, grant proposal, and receiving this funding to boost um, the implementation of it. We have a similar example in Brazil, where Dennis Misne, another Ashoka fellow, has been working to um, ensure that there is a decrease in circulation of guns in the country. Um, he's been working on it since uh, early 2000s, building up solid evidence and research ensure, um, showing that the high circulation of guns in the country contributes significantly to high casual violence. Um, and they have been working to increase the awareness on the problem among civil servants and politicians across the political spectrum, because Dennis believes if we want to bring about changes that are lasting and not going to be overthrown in one or two years, the consensus needs to be achieved. So they've been working a lot on building the awareness and willingness of government counterparts through a broad collective advocacy action and public campaigning. And then again, very importantly, he's been very instrumental in building up government's capacity on the side of police and on the side of legislators as well to draft uh, one of the strictest uh, disarmament statutes in the world that Brazil now has. Um, and then making sure that police is trained to to enforce this the statute, but also that government has enough trust from citizens who were invited to bring their guns back um, to, to government and kind of give it up. So they ensured the highest, um, the, the largest buyback of guns in history of Brazil through that collective action. And they significantly reduced the gun circulation and with the research of UNESCO and Ministry of Health, uh, showing that this contributes significantly in the homicide rate in Sao Paulo, but also in Brazil. So what does it all say to us? Um, what, there are several changes that need to happen on the side of both social entrepreneurs, government, and also intermediaries. Social entrepreneurs need to understand that they 
if they want to achieve large scale change, they need to overcome that understanding that they will be only the direct implementers, so direct deliveries, service deliverers, and they would be working with government as one of their key partners, and they would be working with government in a constructive manner, and they would be also willing and able to raise their awareness, willingness, and capacity to implement. On the side of government, we see that governments, it's very important that they start seeing this um, strange creatures, the social entrepreneurs who are so committed to, the, to solving the problem and they're very systemic, so that they start perceiving them as eye level partners in designing or redesigning systems, in improving them, they would start seeing them as someone who could help de-risk certain undertakings and help government in, improve their service delivery. And government, of course, also needs to establish quicker communication channels, something that Giroud was talking about and having some contact points. But what is the role of intermediaries like Ashoka or UNDP and the next gen government and other initiatives that are um, now being designed within the UNDP? I think our role is, of course, crystallizing the insights from both sides and ensuring that there is a, a space to convene and to, to connect among social entrepreneurs and government entities so that they can see each other, they, so that governments can also hear what are the, the requests or what are the suggestions for improving the ecosystem so that they can develop their regulations. And the final note from my side, I wanted to just share a couple of initiatives that might be an inspiration. You have already heard about Catalyst 2030. Ashoka is developing an initiative called Hello Europe, which is an initiative to help bridge the gap between systems entrepreneurs and government in the, in the topic of um, migration and integration. Um, in Europe, a very interesting format of inviting systems entrepreneurs and government to meet each other and to see whether EU could be integrating several um, recommendations coming from systems entrepreneurs. There is another interesting initiative I have found in Israel, which is called JDC DNA in Israel, which is um, the initiative to be the eyes and ears of government on the ground and to find interesting initiatives among citizen sector and see whether the government could be adopting them at a larger scale. And then if they find such initiatives, they accompany them and they open the right doors and navigate in the corridors, which I think is a very important role to play. And there, I haven't seen very many players who do this. Um, another initiative I found recently is Catch 22 Incubate Accelerate and Amplify initiative in the UK. I don't know much about it in person, but um, what I under, from what I understood, it helps uh, citizen initiatives test new approaches to delivering public services. And if they work well, they help secure public funding to increase the delivery at a large scale in partnership with government. And then there is a report that it, it's not an initiative, but a report called Leveraging Government Partnerships for Scaled Impact, which uh, sheds more light on what could be the roles of government and social entrepreneurs in working together with each other and what they need to keep in mind when doing so. Thank you, and I'm sorry I have exceeded the time limit and over to you, Courtney. Well, oh, big, big thank you, uh, Olga, and I really appreciate you sharing some of those examples. Um, and as we, we were discussing, as we we're kind of uh, thinking through the development of this, you know, the session, of course, um, Olga, Daru, and, and Odin have, are familiar with, you know, the Next Gen Gov uh, initiative that is being piloted here in Asia, but certainly um, also throughout parts of the other UNDP networks uh, in different regions as well. Um, and so, you know, one of the things with the Accelerator Lab, similar to what you're mentioning with this JDC initiative, is, you know, the eyes and ears, so this an institutionalization of connecting and almost crowdsourcing initiatives that are from the citizen sector and thinking how does that, they're the bridge, how does that scale at government or in the public services domain. Um, just, to, just to say that one of the uh, things in the Philippines, for example, um, this was also shared, there's, there's a different flavor of that, but uh, a similar type of pilot going on um, with the government where they're looking at grassroots innovation and seeing how locally uh, you know traditional you know, knowledge type of innovation is actually something that could be um, relevant to the rest of the country and in the government too so i wanted to um, i'm going to work i guess backwards and i do want to say thanks i see some uh, questions coming into the chat box of course we have a lot of i'm just looking at all of the um those that are joining uh with us and we have certainly a lot from our accelerator labs and networks uh, UNDP networks as well as guests in, in different organizations. So uh, please do share your questions or your comments and resources in the chat. We're, we will definitely get to it um, and or raise your hand if, you know, if you're into that as well. There's so many different ways to, to engage. But one of the things that I think is quite relevant to, especially to this audience um, is, 
is around mindsets. And in the first report that came out earlier in the year, launched at Davos, around you know really the thesis to the to the work setting the stage, not just the one that was out last month around how to respond to the crisis, but when we're talking about uh, transforming systems as well as funding for systems, um, there is no, I think this was in the report, there is no systems change unicorn. Um, but Olga, to the, to the, you know, your experience working in with public sector um, and public innovators in that sense, you were mentioning this piece around, um, you know, empathy and, and, and the, as that as a capability, right? And so we do know that, for example, A2I in Bangladesh, that actually um, other uh, institutions and governments are coming to them for, for better understanding how to build the service design mindset and or the human-centered uh, approach, people-centered approach. So in this space, one of the key things when we talk about systems change, for starters, one is just the learning curve. Does everyone even understand what we're talking about? What do we mean when we do say systems change? So you did share a little bit of a lens in, in one version of that perspective, but um, what are some of the tactics and methods that you've seen you know, in terms of shifting the government mindset to embrace the systems thinking and systems change piece? Because um, not everybody gets it straight away and, and that's absolutely fine. Um, we're all working towards demystifying it at large, but we, we're running around with this buzzword as if everybody was thinking of it in, in the same vein. So maybe Olga, over to you first, if you had any kind of um, you know, insights and lessons learned through your experience and, and Drew equally so, you, know, you as, a, as a practitioner, uh, you know, Schwab Fellow, Ashoka Fellow, which are known f uh, and acknowledged for their systems change and systemic entrepreneurship uh, work in the field, this is an uphill battle. So, what have you noticed um, as being really helpful in, in shifting mindsets? And then maybe if you had something around, what are the, the one or two key blocks that you see that we need to work on you know, as a field uh, to, to be shifting? What are the walls that, are, that stand in the way? So Olga, over to you to first on that one. Thank you, Courtney. I think this is exactly what you said, like uh, what can we do with these walls between the sectors? I think what could be done is actually bringing different perspectives together. And we see that one of the social entrepreneurs, Clara, that I was talking about, she said, you know, our success in working with government, of course, lies 50% in understanding the technicalities, the laws and the regulations and how to get here and there in the system. But um, another 50% another is actually understanding and having these relationships with government counterparts, having these human relationships. She has been emphasizing how they have been establishing human and almost like friendly relationships with their government counterparts to ensure that they co-create the approach together. They travel together. They have been locked in one bus to travel through the country. They have been locked in one airplane to go to another country, see that it works. They have been discussing the system and the solutions and their potential approaches in many different times. And so thoroughly and slowly they have been doing it throughout years. There is no magic wound that would ensure that our government counterparts understand the system the way we understand in a second, but it, it just takes years of, um, I think, having having some shared tools to, to describe the system and to question different ways how we understand the system and make sure that we come to some common denominator, that this is how we understand the system, this is how we see the rules in the system, the resources. And I, I have seen in the comments that somebody said that different people, different stakeholders perceive results differently, and it's true. So understanding who sees which results in the system, who sees which roles and relationships, and just co-creating this together. The report that I shared, Leveraging Government Partnership for Scaled Impact, in the very last slide, it actually talks about two approaches, build first or build together for social entrepreneurs. Build first is when a social entrepreneur has the idea and how they want to change the system, and then they come to government and say, here it is, take it. And then, which is considered perhaps less effective than, yes, a social entrepreneur has an idea of how, of how a system needs to change, but then inviting the government counterparts and other counterparts in the system, like funders and other citizen sector organizations, other intermediaries, to, to collectively understand the system using the principles of collective impact, the five principles or other principles to ensure that there is a shared understanding and slowly developing it together. We were, and, and just the final note, with my colleague, another Ashoka fellow, Sasha Haselmeyer, who is also very concerned about how do we shift the government's understanding of systems, we have been just recently contemplating. If we as Ashoka have 4,000 social entrepreneurs, systemically working social entrepreneurs across the world, and we can vouch for them and we can work with them easily, we can influence them in a way because we have our communication channels. I am now developing the online course on how social entrepreneurs can be working with government. 
what are the channels of delivering this information to government counterparts? Like how, what, is there a, a, a channel that can deliver it to all of them at the same time? Or is it like individually, is it through the school of mayors, something like Bloomberg is doing? What are the effective channels of influencing the government, maybe through UN or through other intermediaries? So perhaps if somebody in the audience can share their perspective on this, this would be great because we need to be building capacity on multiple sides of capacity to think in systems, on the side of systems entrepreneurs, on the side of governments, and then we need to bring them together to work effectively. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And um, I think I'm just going to add on one of, you know, we're getting a question here from Afreen. So she's one of our colleagues who's government innovation lead for the region here working on NextGenGov. So very much also coming from the experience of working in government, now working a little bit more as an intermediary. And her question was around, could you share the experience where social entrepreneurs and government have worked together on systems and managed to bring in collective impact? Any documented results would really help us add to the next gen gov resources. So I think you already gave a few concrete examples in your in your session presentation, but if there was a, a space in which a, re, a few resources you would really uh, point us to that have that um, you know, uh, outline, that would be really helpful. Do you have anything, uh, further resources or ways you'd like to answer that question? Is the question to me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we are about to launch the online course, which is specifically for social entrepreneurs. But I think the case studies um, that I presented today, and there are six more case studies, would be uh, as insightful for social entrepreneurs as they would be for other intermediaries or government. So um, no public link yet. But if you're interested, maybe I can just share it with Courtney once it's published, and then she could share it uh, through broader channels. Thank you. Great. Thanks. We also have, um, uh, you know, another question coming in. We also, we also oh, can I just intervene? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, my earlier organization, Child and Youth Finance International, worked with governments in 152 countries. And we changed policies in 85 countries. We actually have a written case study on how it's done, what are the principles, and how you can take it forward. Uh, I agree with Holdra that co-creation is something which is very important, but there are also other principles on how you need to take it forward, and uh, which I think are probably as important, which is starting with calibration, the baseline, moving into convening, and actually jointly then co-creating and then celebrating successes. What I think is important with Child and Youth Finance International is not only did we start it, we actually shut the organization down because we were able to hand it over to OECD, to uh, ICC, and to RC. So we were able to hand it over to UN bodies who were doing similar type of work and helped OECD build in its own capacity to do it. Why do I say this, which is important, is because sometimes when we think of governments, we just think of a country. But the UN system is the system which actually has the largest capacity to be able to make things through. So I think this is something which is very important. And we will share you the case study with child helplines in India. Uh, what we did is actually, and I think there is a step before you start working with governments, having worked with more than 100 plus governments actively. For child helplines, if you go straight and say, I have an idea, they'll throw you out. So we also have to be very, very practical. You need to actually create something which is a sizable pilot. You can tell them you're doing it, but you need to create a sizable pilot. So when we were taking uh, Child and India through, we had to create a child pilot, reach around 10,000 phone calls, and then start conversations with the government. Because then you're able to start getting their interest to take to scale. So we need to recognize in the field, and this is what Odin was saying, that social entrepreneurs actually play a key role in building the first proof of concept before governments are able to take it on and before they are also actually willing to listen and give you a seat at the table. With child helplines, once we had the India example, we actually followed a very cookie cutter example which helped us scale to 100 countries in three years for child protection initiatives. And we said in every country, we start a baseline, we create a small project where governments see, give them examples from around the region and then get them in. And that was an effect which worked extremely fast. And again, that was being documented. So I can again share that with you. So I think there are certain principles, but my major obstacle always is 
who is the right person in the government. Therefore, the ask in our report is we need uh, we need a contact point in governments to be able to work with. And as I am talking, I see the government of Benin has responded to my phone call. So, yeah, Elizabeth, we are going to collaborate with you. And if you put your email in, we will collaborate with the government of Benin, our first government with Catalyst, and we will work with you. And we have a very clear system. We start with saying, what are your government's needs? Where are your gaps? We have with not just Catalyst members, but like Ashoka has 4,000, Echoing Green has again 4,000. We have a whole pool of entrepreneurs and we'll give it to you by your SDG gaps and needs. And then we will co-create a solution on how to make this happen. So hats off to Benin for volunteering. Thank you. I hope many more countries will volunteer and we'll reach our target of 10 pilot countries at the end of this phone call. I have to make my pitch because otherwise it's just talk, talk, talk. You know, it's just talk, talk, talk. Sorry. Okay, thanks, thanks, Juru. And, um, you know, we're seeing a living case study of a systems entrepreneur in action. So thanks uh, again for sharing the news and making the pitch. Um, so I wanted to, to segue. So you, you just to get to Afrin's point, you got, you, you shared a little bit example of, of actually the organization you started that was uh, scaled to such success that eventually it was adopted and taken over um, by government. This is well documented. We will follow up with a uh, request for a few more of these kind of cases that are documented for collective impact, um, which can help, you know, again, make the argument for um, discussion is, I should say, uh, for, for doing things a little bit differently. Um, or inspiring others in, in the bureaucracy, so to speak. So I'm gonna bundle the next uh, few questions together just to be mindful of time. And then, um, you know, let's see how, you know, we can maybe Odin, you could also be one of the first ones to, to respond and share. So if you don't mind, just, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to kind of get to closer, uh, Odin, was when you mentioned that intermediaries such as the UN, for example, need to be um, investing in, um, literally our role is different to invest in the non-investable systemic initiatives. Just if you could clarify that just a little bit. And then um, one of the things when I see look in the chat box is, is a little bit more, I think people are hungry to, to get to the tactics, right? So we have strategy and tactics that we're looking for your shortcuts that you've gotten through your, you know, your learnings from the field and as, as practitioners. So one of the questions as well is around um, specifically, you know, um, how, what happens before there's a big crowd, before there's the momentum? What are the preconditions that you're seeding? Um, what is the strategic way of going about that such that you can make the case to where, for example, uh, you know, government would adopt, you know, the proof of concept, so to speak, that's already there. Um, in, and also, you know, what is the, how do you start a communication channel with governments? Um, so two other key pieces that I want to pull out of questions that were parked there before we go over to Odin. Um, one is about when we're talking about building capacity of governments, you know, who are you really targeting and what departments? Because often people in the in bureaucracies, they can get transferred around and the connectivity can get lost. So we're always talking about bridging silos, but in, in real, real practice, this is quite complicated. And so much of it's based on trust, social capital relationships, who knows who um, at the end of the day. So if there is any type of, um, you know, insights on the hacking around that, so to speak. And then from our colleague in Nepal, Bissam, um, saying there might be government officials who are believers of systemic entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs and who can champion these innovative solutions, but sometimes the bureaucracy is the hurdle for them to get things going quickly or uh, fast. And um, you know, this is something we had talked about also in our previous conversations. Um, you know, what kind of ways are you noticing might be uh, shortcuts or fast tracks to that. If you have some um, insights or takeaways, that would be appreciated. So just my, being mindful, we have uh, you know a little bit under 10 minutes, so to speak, before we're gonna close, but um, wanted to make sure we clarify the, the key takeaway when we're talking about um, intermediaries and in government, what should we be investing in for systems change? Uh, Odin, if you can shed light on that. And then any of these tactics and strategies specifically around working directly with government more effectively. So I, I answer the first and then um, just catch on the second, I guess. So for the first, I mean, let me tie back the examples that Olga gave to the iPhone example, or even what Jeru said about child and youth finance, uh, financial uh, education. I mean, 
look at what these people did and then try to come up with a business model that could pay back a social investor. I mean, good luck. Um, I have personally developed 100 strategies for systems change with social entrepreneurs and I have seen 200 more. Maybe 10 of those were able to build a business model around their systemic uh, initiatives. All the others had to rely on other sources of support and financing. And that is because making data available to governments has no business model. Um, creating a coalition of actors to do stereo lobbying doesn't have a business model. Uh, explaining to bureaucracies how to improve their capacity to implement the service doesn't have, and so on and so on and so on, right? So um, you, just by listening to these examples, you can see that social finance is not the answer here. <laughs> you, you need to, like, the, the contribution that the government and the UN agency can make is to become more open to social entrepreneurs, to have a point of contact, to, to steward the, these ideas um, through bureaucracy, to, um, to have, like, to have a, a scouting team that finds systemic innovations proactively and, and um, turns them into policy ideas. These are things that you can do that would leverage the resources that the UN has. It's not money. Yes, you have some money, but that's not what we need. What we need is your, your political capital, your goodwill, your convening power. Like this is, this is the strength of a UN agency. So use those things rather than money. Money will come once the other things are in place, just as it did for the iPhone. I have no worries about that. Um, and then regarding the tactics and the shortcuts, forget the tactics and the shortcuts. Like as soon as, like it's, I'm, I'm a believer in, the, uh, in this approach of, um, making making people want to reach another continent and they'll figure out the shipbuilding themselves. Like, yes, you will find a lot of documentation about tactics. I, I mentioned um, the podcast here that has good examples. There is a new report called Systemic and Empowering where we feature like in depth how five social entrepreneurs did these types of changes also in collaboration with governments. You will find the, the tactics and, and you, you are entrepreneurial enough to figure out the details. The important thing is to have the right type of goal and the right type of mindset. And that is that is the barrier here. Um, once you are confused about the details, you are already 80% done. That's not, that's not the problem here. Thanks, Odin. I think that's, uh, it's very much related to a lot of the discussions we're having in house around mission oriented innovation. Um, you know, what is the, the collective overarching um, goal that we can rally around and then what are the different directions um, to collaborate on to get there. I did want to open that question, however, to, to Olga or Jeru, because I know we, we're all coming from different perspectives and maybe hearing that question a little differently, if there's any kind of um, reflections or, or thoughts around that uh, from your experience would be great. And then we'll wrap with uh, some, some final words from each of you, if you have, uh, for closing uh, takeaways for us. But um, Daru or Olga, anything that you wanted to respond to that question around working with government specifically? I think the difficultest point is finding the right person to reach out to. And if you find that, then working with governments is quite easy. Uh, I, I have worked with a lot of governments and personally, I find it very, very easy to work with them. Uh, yes, there is bureaucracy. Yes, there is delays, but I really don't think it is a problem at all. I think that I think if you what Olga mentioned, I think is also very key is if you look at them as just as committed individuals who are working with you to change the system from where they are. And that's the same with the UN. So for me, I think a tip. Yes, we need to what, know what is the bigger picture. Uh, but where we forget is this whole point of we are all in different units. We are not. We are all working together. So for me, the biggest takeaway for anyone in government or UN or wherever is just think of people as human beings and then it will be fine. So that's what I would say. It sounds very simplistic, but that's the one point which will be the first point in systems change. Not the theories, not the strategies. They'll follow. They are needed. Like Odin said, they're really, really important. But the mindset shift is the most important, which we somehow lack currently. And I think that's what Catalyst is trying to say by saying, have one person, one contact point, so we break down the barriers and the silos. 
Thanks, Drew. And I will just build on that. I think the mindset or the perception of uh, stakeholders of each other, how social entrepreneurs perceive government and how government perceive social entrepreneurs. I think this is where perhaps intermediaries could play a better role and Ashoka itself could be playing a better role. How do we communicate better to government who a social entrepreneur is, who a systemic social entrepreneur is, that it, it is a partner to work on. It's not necessarily a danger. I see here a comment from Kyrgyzstan saying that if they would very likely be seen as an opposition. When we did the, the recent survey among Ashoka social entrepreneurs with 800 um, of them around the world, we have seen that, yes, in some of the restrictive environments, one third of our Ashoka fellows have to resort to confrontational measures, meaning um, a more kind of significant pressure on government counterparts in terms of uh, mobilizing people, uh, protests, petitions, or even strategic litigation, taking government to court, but double as many, uh, about 70% of social entrepreneurs choose to work with government in a constructive way before they resort to confrontation. So I think it's important for anyone who wants to work with government to be very open about the constructive nature of their relationships, saying that we are here not to endanger you. And some of social entrepreneurs who we talked to said, we are very clear in making, um, uh, uh, making it clear that we are not watchdogs. There are other organizations who can play a very important the role of a watchdog, but we choose to be a constructive partner by government. So we see as long as government is willing to develop with us and to co-create with us, we will not be publicly shaming them for some mistakes if they are willing to improve. So this con conscious role of being a constructive partner to government rather than a confrontational, which could be an option, but later on when, you know, constructive measures have been tried and, and coming with this perspective, I think is very important with this mindset. Great. Thank you so much. Um, with that, we are at the bottom of the hour and I did want to, um, you know, promise everybody that we will be uh, following up with all of the, the mentioned, um, you know, the links, the, the, the sharings of reports, et cetera, in the follow-up email for those that registered for the, the webinar. Um, but before we close, are there, I would like to offer um, our panelists uh, a moment to share the one sticky takeaway that you would like to leave with us. So of course we explored so many things from meta to micro, um, some quite granular cases, for example, thanks to, to Olga, especially the living case of Daru as, as an actual practitioner in the field. Um, in the trenches, and then certainly with Odin, who's been curating so many of these conversations and, and you know, taking the, the extractions of key messages and insights uh, and, and giving them to a spoon feeding almost. Um, but any last uh, comment, question, invitation um, over to each of you to, to share before we wrap up? I just support the Ruth's call to action. Um, wherever you are in the government or you're an agency, um, establish a point of contact for social entrepreneurs that will make so many things so much easier. It's super cheap. It has a high value. It opens, uh, yeah, it, it starts tearing down the barriers. It's the, the one first thing that all of you should be doing. So please reach out to us and Jeroen in particular. Um, many of the other finer points will become easier afterwards. Hi. And building on Odin, if there are countries or UN people who want to start by doing that, get in touch and I do hope we have our 10 country pilots. So others who are following Ben in, so we can create something systemic to showcase. Thank you. And uh, I could say perhaps that if we could all together see ways how social entrepreneurs with all their amazing resources uh, that they bring to the table, how they would be not circumventing the government and not building parallel structures to government, kind of wasting their resources, but joining the resources with government. That would be of great help. And if you know ways how, while we are building the capacity on the side of social entrepreneurs, there are ways how to build capacity on the side of governments to better think in systems and to better collaborate with social entrepreneurs, please let us know and collaborate with us uh, on this. Thank you for organizing the session. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, just a really big uh, note of appreciation and signing off over here. We've, we've been discussing, um, you know, this session off and on for, for quite some time. So it's really nice to see it come together. And a big thanks to everyone that took the time to invest in joining live and, and offering comments and questions and thoughts for that dialogue. So um, certainly, as I already mentioned, we'll share the recording and the, and the resources and uh, it sounds like the invitation to continue via email, et cetera, directly with, with each of our speakers is there. 
So um, contact information, et cetera, will be, will be shared in that follow-up too. So uh, just to continue the conversation, we'll have part B of the series in the second half of August. More details to come soon. But with that, um, big thanks once more and take care. Wishing everyone a great rest of your day. Cheers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, all of you. Thank everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.